And um, I live, and we're living in a science fiction nightmare today. Here in Oklahoma, and across our country, where my children and the children of most Americans, including most of the kids in this state, can no longer engage in the seminal, primal activity of American youth, which is to go fishing with their father and mother in the local fishing hole, and then come home and safely eat the fish, because somebody gave money to a politician. I live two hours south of the Adirondack Mountains, which is the oldest protected wilderness on the face of the earth. It's been protected as forever wild since 1888. We had a right, the American people, to believe that generations of our citizens would be able to enjoy those pristine landscapes and lakes and forests unspoiled. But today, one fifth of the lakes in the Adirondacks is sterilized from acid rain, which is coming from those same coal burning power plants and which has incidentally destroyed the forest cover on the high peaks of the Appalachians from Georgia all the way up into northern Quebec. And this president, having accepted $100 million from that industry, has put the brakes on the statutory requirements that they clean up the acid rain. And a few months ago, the EPA announced that as a direct result of those rollbacks, for the first time in 30 year history of the Clean Air Act, the levels of sulfur dioxide this year went up in America's air, an astronomical 4% a single year. Um, two years ago in May, almost to the day, today's date, I flew over the coal fields of the Appalachians over Kentucky and West Virginia, and I saw something that if the American people could see it, there would be a revolution in this country. We are cutting down the Appalachian Mountains with these giant machines called dragonflies. They're 22 stories high. You know, the, uh, I, I flew under one of them in a Piper Cup. And we are destroying, you know, the, these, these landscapes that, you know, uh, where Danny Boone and Davy Crockett from, that are so much, uh, so much of American history and culture is rooted in those landscapes. These machines cost half a billion dollars, and they practically dispense with the need for human labor, which indeed is the point. When my father was fighting strip mining in Appalachia back in the 60s, I remember a conversation that I had with him when I was 14 years old, where he said to me, they're not just destroying the environment, but they're permanently impoverishing these communities. Because there's no way that they can ever regenerate an economy from these barren landscapes that are left behind. And he said, they're doing it so they can break the unions, which is exactly what they did. When he told me that, there were 140,000 unionized mine workers in West Virginia digging coal out of tunnels in the ground. Today, there's fewer than 11,000 miners left in the state, and almost none of them are unionized because the strip industry is, and, and they're taking the exact same amount of coal out of West Virginia every year as they were in 1968. The only difference is, back in 1968, at least some of that money was staying in West Virginia, and those communities and salaries and pensions for those men. Today, virtually all of it just goes straight up to Wall Street. The offices, corporate offices of massive coal, as we would call them, the banking houses like Morgan Stanley, which own these operations that are at, that are dismantling the state and liquidating those landscapes for cash and using these giant machines and 2,500 tons of dynamite that are exploded every day in West Virginia, a Hiroshima bomb once a week. They're blowing the tops off the mountains to get at the coal seams beneath. And they take the rock and debris and rubble and they scrape it into the adjacent river valley. They bury the hollow, they flatten the landscape. They've buried already 1,200 miles of America's rivers and streams. They've cut down 460 mountains. By the time this president leaves office, they will have flattened an area of the Appalachians the size of Delaware. It's all illegal. You cannot in the United States take rock and debris and rubble and dump it into a waterway without a Clean Water Act permit, and you could never get a Clean Water Act permit to do such a thing. So we sued them in front of a conservative Republican federal judge, Judge Charles Hayden, in West Virginia. And Judge Hayden said the same thing I said. He said, it's all illegal, it's been illegal since day one, and he enjoyed all mountaintop mining. Two days from when we got that decision, lobbyists for massive coal and PBD coal Men in the back door of the Interior Department was Stephen Growls, who was the number two deputy. He's the number one deputy under Gail Norton, and he was a former lobbyist for Massey Coal and Peabody Coal. And they rewrote one word of the Clean Water Act, the definition of the word fill, the interpretation of that, to change 30 years of statutory interpretation to effectively overrule Judge Hayden's decision 
and to have a heart and soul out of the Clean Water Act and make it legal as it is today, not just in West Virginia, but in Oklahoma and every other state in this country, to dump rock, debris, rubble, garbage, solid waste, construction waste, any kind of solid material into any waterway in the United States without a Clean Water Act permit. All you need today is a rubber stamp permit from the Corps of Engineers, which in some districts you can get on the telephone or through the mail. So this is what we're dealing with today. This is not just the destruction of our environment. It is the subversion of American democracy. And, you know, the, 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 the big polluters and their indentured servants in the political process and their slick PR firms and their phony uh, think tanks in Washington, D.C., like the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, and their phony tobacco scientists like Fred Singer, these bunch of, you know, biostitutes, they've been very adept over the past 20 years, two decades, at marginalizing environmentalists as, you know, tree hunters or radicals, or as I heard the other day, pagans who worship trees and sacrifice people. But there is nothing radical about the idea of clean air and clean water for our children. 